Okay, it's official. Let's get started. Whoops. Okay, welcome to session five. Today we're going to be doing some in-depth cemetery research courtesy of Kimberly, Katie, and Heather from the Archdiocese. We're going to talk about a lot of things today. I'm going to introduce the session and do a little housekeeping as per usual. We'll go over the basics of how these sessions run. So this is the fifth session of a six week Zoom collaboration between my department, the City Archives and Special Collections, which are housed at the New Orleans Public Library, the Office of Archives and Records of the Archdiocese of New Orleans, and New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. Today we will discuss cemetery research and care, including where to start, different tablet and tomb types, and we'll also cover a bit about perpetual care and restoration programs at New Orleans Catholic cemeteries. Housekeeping time. Please make a note of any questions you have during the presentation and reserve them until we open the chat function at the end. I'll be opening it up so you all can ask questions. Please ask them respectfully and in order. Let your other uh, classmates ask questions as well before you ask a second. Of course, I will let you know when the chat function is open for you all to start asking the questions. And when we do that, we'll also have our contact information up. If we have time, we'll take a look at some content as well on websites. We will address the content of this presentation only. If your question pertains to a future or past presentation, either save it or email it to us. If we have time, of course, we will get to it. We will get to as many questions as we can by 1215 today. Recordings of each session are going to be made available or are made available because we're almost through the entire series now on the programs and presentations page at my website, archives.nolalibrary.org. They're made available on the Tuesday following, so don't worry if you can't write as fast as we talk today. You'll be able to view the presentation again anytime on our YouTube channel and on our program channel we'll have supplemental materials from past presentations and also links to the slides. We put the slides up after the session, so as much like we put up the recording after the session. We would love to be here with y'all today, but we will make sure that you can catch it afterwards if you miss it. This is just a quick demonstration of where you need to go to view the program page. That's sort of our program hub has all of the links to all of the additional resources, websites, and of course, the recording videos. That is, you go to archives.nolalibrary.org. And right up at the top in new at the archives section, you'll see our program, Identifying Your Catholic Ancestors Fall 2020 Genealogy Series. Just click on that and the entire page is organized as sort of every session. Of course, there are going to be materials from previous sessions that apply to the sessions that we have today and next week. So download everything, take a look at everything. It will help, I promise. So let's do a meet our presenters. Although you all are probably very familiar with us by now, we do hope that there are some new folks today and that you guys can meet us again. Okay, so we have Kimberly Johnson. She's a senior processing archivist and records analyst for the Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans, where she helps manage conservation and preservation of historic and current records. She holds a master's of arts and history and is a certified archivist. Hi, Kim. Heather Veneziano is the Director of Public Engagement and Development for New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, as well as an architectural historian and cultural heritage advisor with the preservation firm of Gambrel and Peak. She holds a Master's of Fine Art and a Master's of Preservation Studies. Hi, Heather. Hi. Katie Vest is the research archivist for the Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans. In addition, she researches and translates genealogy requests for them in French, Spanish, Italian, and German. She holds a Master's of Arts in History with an emphasis in public history and is a certified archivist. Hey, Katie. Hey. And of course, I am Amanda Fallis. I'm a librarian and archivist at the New Orleans City Archives and Special Collections housed at New Orleans Public Library. There, I work with genealogical and municipal government records. 
I hold a master's of library and information science and I too am a certified archivist. So you're in safe hands today, everybody. So let me hand it off to y'all. Let's talk about some cemetery books. Hello again, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. If you didn't know already or haven't been to a presentation yet, my name is Katie Vest. I am the research archivist at the Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans. Today, I will briefly talk to you about the cemetery records held by the Office of Archives and Records. Before we begin, I would like to say that in this first part of the session, I will be speaking exclusively about the records held by the Office of Archives and Records. While we work, while we often work with the New Orleans Catholic cemeteries, the records we hold are separate from theirs and recorded differently sometimes. Here you see examples of some of the cemetery books we hold. On the left are the burial records for St. Patrick's Cemetery that span from 1847 to 1958. And that little blue line you see at the end, that is, a, that is one of the record books for St. Rock Cemetery. On the right are some of the burial books for St. Louis Cemetery, for the St. Louis cemeteries. Their whole collection spans for over 140 years. The cemetery records are some of my personal favorites. But before we get into the nitty gritty, let's revisit who to call when you are looking for a cemetery record. One of the first things that we ask of researchers is to double check the whom to call for cemetery or grave information document. As Heather mentioned in session two, this document provides you with the cemeteries, the date range that each office holds, and the phone number of who to call. For us, the Office of Archives and Records, we hold the books on the right-hand side that are in blue, but be aware there are gaps in those records. For example, there is a gap in St. Louis number one from 1840 to 1859. Now to the fun. I wanted to pr provide you all with some examples of the different cemetery entries that you can find within our books. Here we have two different entries, one with minimal information and one with a plethora of information. The cemetery records can be used to locate additional information on your family and possibly their location within a particular cemetery. On the top of this slide, you see an entry for Albert Marceline. He is recorded in the book with his last name first. So in the book, it's recorded as Marceline Albert. Albert was buried on July 10th, 1872 in St. Louis Cemetery number two, square three. The only other information provided is his exact place of burial. The image at the bottom of the, of the slide is a burial for Eugene Desette in St. Louis Cemetery number one, who was buried on October 27th 1898. It provides the researcher with his race, gender, cause of death, age, place of death, and place of birth. As you can see here, it does not mention a tomb location. These are just two examples of the different information you can gain from the cemetery records. Some have a plethora of information, but no location of burial. Others just have the name, date of death, and a location. Always remember that not all cemetery records are the exact same. They sometimes varied based off the New Orleans Health Commissioners and the record keepers at the time. Heather will be talking more about this later in the presentation. Another example I wanted to show you all is how rare it can be to have a location notated in the cemetery record. This is a page out of St. Joseph's Cemetery Book from 1898. Here you see 12 burial entries but only two of them have a location notated in the margin. Keep in mind, when a location is given, the information might be limited, as we see in these two entries. Now you may be wondering, what do I do if there is no location recorded? Don't be worried. During her presentation, Heather will be discussing how to use other resources that can be helpful to locate a tomb if you are unable to, unable to find a location within our records. Now, Heather Veneziano from the New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries will show you the additional resources and how to use the cemeteries themselves as a resource. Oh, great. Thank you, Katie. Um, as Katie mentioned, I'm Heather Veneziano, the Director of Public Engagement and Development for New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. 
And today I'll be discussing some additional resources not mentioned in previous sessions, as well as how to use the cemetery itself as a research tool. During the last session's Q&A period, a few people had questions about the Protestant section of St. Louis Cemetery Number 1. To start off my portion of this session, I thought it, I would expand on some of my responses and offer a little bit of history about the site. St. Louis Cemetery Number 1 dates to 1789 and was begun as a response to overcrowding at the earlier cemetery on St. Peter Street in the French Quarter. Initially constructed outside the city's ramparts, the cemetery grew substantially during the first few years of use. Very early on, a section was set aside behind the consecrated ground by the city government and was dedicated to the burial of non-Catholics or strangers to the city and functioned as the unofficial city cemetery. This plot of ground did not hold a separate name. In 1805, the city granted the newly established Episcopal Congregation of Christ Church ownership of the small public cemetery. It then became known as the Protestant Burial Ground. Christ Church managed it from that point until 1822, when the city initially showed interest in cutting streets through the cemetery and offered their growing congregation a tract of land on Faubourg Street at the head of Gerard Street for the building of a new Protestant cemetery which would later be known as the Gerard Street Cemetery. Christ Church purchased the new three and a half acre parcel for $3,140 with the stipulation that the city council could relocate the cemetery if the city grew to be too close to it and therefore potentially putting the lives of the city's inhabitants at risk due to health concerns. In June of 1832, the New Orleans City Council finalized the plan to extend Conti, Treme, and Basin Streets in a way to cross the land occupied by St. Louis Cemetery No. 1. The church wardens and city, sur city surveyor, Joseph Pele, supervised the work to transfer the burials within the way of the extensions to within the smaller planned footprint of the cemetery. The current main entrance gate to St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 dates to this road project. In the years that followed, Treme Street was laid out, bisecting the Protestant parcel. By 1838, the majority of the remains in the Protestant section had been relocated to the Gerard Street Cemetery. And in 1840, what was left of the section on the west side of Treme Street was sold as building lots. Today, only a small strip of the Protestant section remains, bordering Treme and Conti Streets, and is now under the care of New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. The Gerard Street Cemetery operated from its founding in 1822 until 1957. The cemetery was constructed upon mostly low-lying ground, making it pr prone to frequent flooding. It is also said that the majority of the tombs were constructed only one brick course deep, instead of the three courses commonly used in the St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 and other cemeteries in the city. This weakened the stability from the onset and aided in shortening their lifespans. With all that being said, however, the cemetery was home to many magnificent and stunning monuments, grand and elaborate tombs, and sweeping vistas of expertly carved marble and precisely chiseled slate and granite. The wealth of the American faction of the city was on full display in their choices of memorial architecture. In January of 1957, after decades of disrepair and neglect, Gerard Street Cemetery was deconsecrated. Some families chose to remove the contents of their tombs to other cemeteries. These transfers are noted in the records of the Christ Church, Christ Church Corporation. By 1957, many tablets within the cemetery were missing or illegible, and records containing burial locations were scarce. Therefore, a great many remains were unclaimed and or unidentifiable. Unclaimed remains of people of color were transferred to the Providence Memorial Park on Airline Drive, and unclaimed remains of whites were transferred to a special crypt in Section K of Hope Mausoleum on Canal Street. Two memorial tablets within the Hope Mausoleum commemorate those transferred, and a bronze tablet in Providence Memorial Park honors the lives of those transferred there. Okay, um, now I would like to share a resource that with you that one of last session's attendees, Beverly Hartzell, who I noticed is also here, so I want to say hi and thank you to her, um, brought to my attention. 
thank you again for sending this along. As we stated in previous sessions, the website familysearch.org is a wonderful source of information and it's free to use as long as you set up an account. To view the documents I'm about to show you, you will first need to register for an account. Once you have one set up, and you will want to log in at www.familysearch.org. On the header bar of the home page, you will then click on the search drop down button and select images. This will take you to a screen in which you will type New Orleans in the place search box. The first collection that is listed, New Orleans 1812 to present, is the one you should select. Then click search image groups. That will take you to a results page with 931 image collections listed. To narrow it down, you should go to the column on the left. At the bottom, where it says life event, you should select death from the drop down. Eight primary record types will then automatically be highlighted. You will want to adjust that so that only the top two are chosen burial record and cemetery record. Click update after having done so, and that will narrow down your results to 95 collections. Now, a word about the collections. Unfortunately, they are not titled, and not all are actually focused on burials or cemeteries. There's quite a few orphanage um, listing books also in the mix. Each image collection contains digitized ver versions of microfilm data, sometimes in the form of typed index cards and sometimes photographic copies of internment books. Also worth mentioning is that each collection sometimes contains more than one data set. Saying that, you may start off with records pertaining to Lafayette Cemetery number one in, one in a collection and then end in that same collection with those of Odd Hills Rest Cemetery. I'm currently trying to get in touch with representatives at FamilySearch in order to title the collections, which will allow for easier searching. Hopefully they will get back to me fairly soon. Moving on, here's an example of one of the collections. This one details burials and interments within St. Joseph Cemeteries number one and two. This specific collection, because of its formatting on index cards, can easily be identified as being the work of the Works Progress Administration in the 1930s for the Tombstone Index of New Orleans Cemeteries. The original index is housed at the Louisiana State Museum at the Mint at the end of Esplanade Avenue in the French Quarter but microfilmed copies are also available at the New Orleans City Archives and Special Collections at the New Orleans Public Library. A full list of all cemeteries included within the index can be found in the Guide to Genealogical Materials located on the library's website, a link to which was posted in previous sessions. Briefly looking at this collection, we can see that the cards contain various pieces of information that may prove helpful to us in our searches. The card on the top Wright record, records the burial of Charles T. Blank, who died on October 3rd, 1878, at only four years and 11 months old. He is listed as burial number 15, but his burial location is not given. The lower card is that of Peter, an enslaved man of 100 years old, whose enslaver was William Blarkley. Peter's remains were buried in the rear plot, but the exact location was not recorded. All of the historic cemeteries of New Orleans contain unmarked in-ground burials from their early periods. Many of these early burials were marked with simple wooden markers that were lost to time, but many others were always unmarked. It was most often the case that in-ground burials would be located at the rear portion of any given cemetery, and as the cemetery became more populated with tombs, the land was eventually built upon. This is an example of a collection that includes scans of an original burial book. In this case, the first book ever created for the St. Patrick Cemetery. It dates to 1841. Here you can see the various details recorded by the re record keeper. They include name, profession, age, gender, race, and whether they were enslaved or free, cause of death, date of birth, place of birth, date of death, place of death, length of residency in New Orleans, and marital status. It also includes a column for additional remarks and observations. As you can see in this example, many of these individuals were listed as having died after contracting yellow fever. These books, as Katie mentioned earlier, provide researchers, researchers with a plethora of information. I highly recommend these image collections to everyone tuning in today. They cover a wide range of cemeteries within the city 
including many outside of the Catholic faith. On the last slide, you saw all of the columns of information that were listed for 1841, but who decided what to include? Why do some years contain a ton of information while others have very little? Well, it all comes down to what was dictated as being required by the City Board of Health for any given year. This 19th century announcement in the newspaper listed the then current requirements. Did all cemetery operators and recorders follow these guidelines? No. Were they supposed to? Yes. Just as today with COVID contact tracing, it was a way for the Board of Health to be aware of information in an effort to track the spread of diseases and to identify their causes. As genealogists, we thrill at years in which a great deal was required to be recorded and our frustrations mount for those years that little was required. Okay, moving on. Um, now to navigate the cemetery, to search for clues and understanding where roadblocks might be. On the left is a photograph of my great grandmother, Rose Maddy, who was born in New York City in 1912 and supposedly died in New Jersey in 1930. The image of her grave marker was sourced from Find a Grave and it took me a very long time to locate it. Why? Because the spelling of her surname on the stone is not what I was looking for. All of my cousins carry the last name Maddy with an I. My grandmother's social security application, though it lists her name spelled as Maddie with an I, lists her mother's surname as Muchi, Muchi, which is the phonetic spelling that a family member supplied. The census of 1930 and of 1940 listed with an I as well. So I was looking for an I and scouring the web for a headstone with the surname spelled that way. It was not until I located the grave of Veronica Deke my three times great grandmother listed below Rose on the headstone that I eventually found hers. All of this is to say is to please stay flexible with spellings. What you may be searching for may be just out of reach merely because you are tied to a specific spelling and not open to alternatives. We have all heard the phrase written in stone, meaning permanent or not able to be changed. However, what, if, what is written in stone is incorrect or not what we were expecting. Just like we make mistakes, people in the past were just as likely to do so also. Slight variations of spelling, incorrect dates, etc. they're all the possibilities. Staying flexible in our expectations and being open to inconsistencies is key to successfully locating information. Another note that while using search engines such as Find a Grave, sometimes key parts of the puzzle go missing. Marble is what we refer to as a very soft stone. That being the case, it is fantastic for carving, but the same attributes that make it the ideal choice for memorialization tablets also limit its lifespan. It is prone to cracks, to surface degradation, and to heavy staining. All of that being said, families often choose to replace original markers. When doing so, the replacement stone may not include all of the information recorded on the original. It's important to know that um, when having stones made and engraved, the price is per letter. So a lot of times people don't include all the information on replacement stones that were on the original stone. Uh, however, many families choose to retain the original stone on site by affixing it to the rear of the monument or to the side of the tomb. The picture on the left is an, is an example and that's in St. Patrick Cemetery number one where they replace the original headstone with the newer one, but they placed the original behind the monument um, horizontally, actually. So it's kind of a rare example. Um, it's always a good idea to walk completely around a tomb you are researching because it may be the case that more information will be visible on an alternate facade. What if the tablet is missing or there never was one? That is when you should check in with us or the Office of Archives and Records in order to run a burial record search. The location information might be included in the entry. Another good place to look is the tombstone index that I mentioned earlier in this presentation or in the New Orleans Cemetery database that are presented during session four. You may also check in at the Historic New Orleans Collection to view the microfilmed 1980s survey data included in the Historic New Orleans Cemetery survey of eight cemeteries. Each entry in the survey includes at least one photograph of the tomb as it appeared in the early 1980s. And many tablets that are lost today were present upon the tombs at that point in time. 
Whose tomb is it? Who's buried there? Why are the names different? As we stated in previous sessions, because of how the burial books are organized, we are unable to tell you everyone interred within a tomb. However, if you supply us with names and dates, we can try to find out their interment location. The name carved into the pediment of most family tombs provides what is most oftentimes a vital piece of information. And just for those who don't know, the pediment stone is the one at the very top that you often see. Um, it is often the name of the original tomb owner, the person or family that paid for it, its construction. But what if the name differs from all the other surnames and names on the closure tablet itself? Sometimes those on the tablet are descendants of the individuals through a daughter, and they carry the name of her husband, and sometimes the tomb was resold at one point in time and the pediment stone was not changed. So the remains of those interred under the original ownership were transferred out of the tomb prior to the sale and after the title was transferred, and the tomb sold to a new owner who started using the tomb for their family and put, it, put on their family's um, enclosure tablet. I want to say here that family to family sales are allowed as long as you work closely with our office and all remains are transferred prior to the sale. New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries never resells tombs on our own. We never sell repossessed tombs or those that are deemed abandoned. All sales of historic tombs are transactions between tomb owners, not us as the cemetery operator. Getting back to a word on pediment and tomb type and tomb owners. Sometimes you will see a Mrs. So-and-so listed on the pediment. Through my own research, I've often found this to be a woman who purchased a tomb so that she and her children from multiple marriages could be interred together. I have sometimes found one or more husbands of hers also interred within the tomb as well. Researching women is hard, as most of us know. They just did not leave as robust of a paper trail as their male counterparts. On tablets in particular, sometimes a woman is merely listed as a missus and then the surname of her husband or widow and the surname of her husband. Using alternative sources, this just means that we have, a bit, have to dig a bit deeper to uncover her identity. It also leaves us as women to think about how we want to be memorialized and what depiction of our name we want written in stone. So you found the tomb, but what does it say? Marble can be unkind over the course of 100 to 200 years. The text often becomes illegible. However, there are tips and tricks that can help immensely in deciphering the text. In this age of smartphones, my go-to option is photographing the tablet with my phone. I can immediately edit the photo on the spot, increasing or decreasing contrast, saturation, highlights, or shadows. 80% of the time, it will get me to a readable image. If you have access to photo editing software in your computer, you can also take that process a step further. If you do not have a smartphone or camera, or if you merely want another option, mirrors and reflective surfaces work wonders in directing the light onto the stone and to casting shadows and to lightening areas. Lightweight dressing mirrors are ideal and reflective car shields used in windows to block the sun's rays also work well. Different times of day with different angles of sunlight impact your success when using these methods. So if you find it does not work at first, I recommend revisiting the site at another time. New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries hopes to offer our future workshop on photographing stones and editing photographs for this purpose. Now some things not to do. Tombstone rubbings are beautiful, yes. Do they damage stones? Yes. Press things with aluminum foil fall under the same category, as does trying to gain definition by using shaving cream. Even though we don't often think of them this way, stones are very fragile, especially carved stone. The best rule of thumb is to avoid all physical contact with tombs and tablets. Sometimes all it takes is a slight touch to cause irreversible damage. Veteran headstones and markers, I'm sure you have all seen some of these throughout the cemeteries. They can be found throughout the country in military cemeteries as well as privately owned ones. But when did the practice start? After the ba Battle of Manassas, the War Department issued General Orders Number 75, September 11th, 1861, that made commanders responsible for burials and marking graves. Wooden markers were first used. In 1873, the first design for stones in national cemeteries was adopted, at first only furnished for members of the Union Army. In 1879, Congress authorized the furnishing of stones for the unmarked graves of veterans in private cemeteries. 
1906, the Act of March of 1906 authorized the furnishing of headstones for the graves of Confederates who died and were buried in federal cemeteries. Following World War I, a new design was adopted for all graves except those of veterans in the Civil and Spanish-American Wars. On the left, you can see an example of a Spanish-American War veteran stone. This is from St. Joseph Cemetery No. 1. Military markers offer, offer us a fantastic gateway into learning more about our ancestors. If they served in the armed forces, there will be a significant paper trail attached to their service. Today, government markers are available to all US veterans. Additional information about the service can be located on the website displayed on the slide. This website also provides a link to the full history of um, government markers. It is also possible to go through the application process for a deceased loved one interred within a historic tomb who did not originally have a government issued marker. Fold 3 through Ancestry, which we've mentioned a few times in previous sessions, is a wonderful resource to locating historic military records to aid you in your search. And I just want to say are available through your library cards. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so besides military markers, the cemeteries also house a large array of other symbolism. These symbols provide clues. Oh, go back one, please, Amanda. Thanks. Um, these symbols provide clues that help shape the narratives of our ancestors' lives. Symbols such as the compass and ruler point to an affiliation with the Masonic order. Symbols of the Daughters of the American Revolution or Daughters of the Confederacy help us to understand a family's military history. And symbols such as the Woodmen of the World tell us about what organizations our ancestors belong to. There are literally hundreds of symbols that aid in cemetery research. Besides the obvious ones, others are representational, such as different flowers carrying different meanings or symbols of doves and lambs. As with photo documentation, we hope to hold a future workshop that will explore cemetery symbolism on a deeper level, looking into all the nuanced clues hidden in plain sight. For today, it will suffice to say that to be sure to take notice of them. They may provide the very piece of the puzzle that you were looking for. In addition, I just wanna say that if you are ever stumped on the, on the meaning of a specific symbol, please reach out to me. I'm more than happy, ha more than happy to help you try to decode it. Now I'm going to go briefly into discussing some of the various tomb types found within our cemeteries. Most of you watching will probably already be familiar with them. However, I think it is worth reviewing, especially if you are, if you find that one of your ancestors in, is interred within a type that you may be somewhat unfamiliar with. The most prevalent tomb type found in our cemeteries by far is the classic two vault family tomb. The design has not changed much over the years, but the materials and construction methods have. Traditionally, they would have been constructed using brick, originally made of river clay. The bricks were joined using lime-based sand mortar. Once the structural components were in place, they were coated with lime-based plaster and ultimately lime wash. Traditionally, many, many colors of lime wash were used within our cemeteries, all sourced from natural materials, such as ochre. As discussed earlier, these tombs would feature marble closure tablets and pediment plaques. Later, granite and other stone types also began being frequently used in the 20th century, and the use of concrete became prevalent. Family tombs generally contain two vaults and are single width, though there are plenty of exceptions, such as this double width tomb seen in this photograph. Coping style tombs most often function as family tombs. They allow for in ground burial with a clear and defined plot line, often single in width. Some are larger, such as this double width tomb located in St. Joseph Cemetery. The materials mentioned in the previous slide, slide apply to these, this type as well. Also, as the previous tomb type, these often contain burials of generations of a family. The memorial marker for this type of, of tomb often are in the form of headstones, some of which feature dramatic carvings depicting popular 19th century mourning motifs. Society tombs are a common feature within most cemeteries in New Orleans. The large scale multi-vault edifices often tower well above the more common family tombs that make up the majority of the cemetery landscape. Individual society tombs hold the remains of members of the society or organization to which they belong during their lifetime. Throughout the course of one's membership, they would have paid dues, which not only helped with the day-to-day -day operations of the organization, 
but also went towards securing a proper funeral and ultimately a place of interment. This option was especially popular for those that were financially unable to afford the cost of a family tomb. Within most society tombs, individual vaults were set aside for specific families or individuals. Sometimes the remains were left undisturbed and sometimes the vaults would be reused depending on the, upon the design of the tomb and the number of members of the society. The tombs of various societies can be found throughout our cemeteries. Some were owned by fraternal organizations, other by religious groups, those dedicated to various trades and benevolent associations. The society name is often carved within the pediment and some tombs also include a dedication stone often at the base which lists the society's organization date and founding members. The design of wall vaults specifically can be traced all the way back to the columbaria of ancient Rome. Though the Roman columbaria contained cremated remains rather than acting as a burial vault, their overall design and basic function is still in use today in cemeteries throughout the world. Wall vaults are named as such because of their alternate function as a wall or a divider between spaces. They can be found bordering the perimeter of many of our cemeteries. The one shown in the photograph delineates the, Catholic, the, <laughs> delineates the Catholic section of St. Louis Cemetery number one from the Protestant section. Families or individuals own individual vaults within the structure. Historically, these vaults were sometimes rented for a period of time until the remains could be transferred to a permanent location. This practice was especially prevalent during periods of pestilence when both vaults of a family tomb were already recently used and another, and another member of the household passed away. Many of our cemeteries contain a number of mausoleums. Most were constructed during, starting in the 1950s and 60s in a nod to modernity, modernity and shifting ideals of memorial architecture. Families or individuals purchased individual vaults within the shared larger structure. Most are semi-indoor spaces that are open to allow for airflow and to better manage issues specific to our climate. Many contain striking stained glass imagery and offer a serene and peaceful environment. Cremation gardens and columbariums are the most recent additions to our cemetery landscapes. St. Michael the Archangel Cremation Garden and mausoleum in St. Louis Cemetery number three was completed just this year and the Queen of All Saints cremation garden within St. Patrick number three was completed last year in 2019. They both offer single and double niches designed for the interment of cremated remains. The Serenity Garden Colibarium in St. Louis Cemetery number three was constructed in 2015. In 1963 the ban on cremation was lifted by the Vatican allowing it to be an acceptable form of afterlife care. However, as a society, the trend towards cremation was slow going. Now more than ever before, more and more people are choosing it as their preferred option. However, there are rules and guidelines put in place by the Vatican that dictate how the cremated remains should be handled. According to the Vatican's doctor doctrinal office, the remains should be kept, quote, in a sacred space, end quote, such as the Catholic cemetery. They also state that the ashes should not be divided or scattered or preserved in mementos such as jewelry. As the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith wrote in 2016, quote, the burial of ashes or their reservation in sacred space ensures that they are not excluded from the prayers and remembrance of their family or other, Christ or other Christian community. And essentially, an essential practice of the faith Burying the cremated remains preserves the deceased's memory and makes it easier to remember them in prayer as well as avoids the possibility of unfitting or superstitious practices, end quote. For our purposes as genealogists, having the ashes interred within a cemetery also helps to trace a location for future, future generations of researchers. And I just wanna add um, before we move on that though we have these areas specifically set aside for cremation use, you are also able to inter cremations within any tomb within our cemeteries. So it's not exclusive to those um, monument types that I just mentioned. So we often hear about perpetual care. We see the plaques on or in front of various tombs and monuments, but what exactly does it mean and is it within reach? 
We offer perpetual care contracts as a way to help you and your family preserve your memorial long after you're gone and perhaps after all your known living descendants are gone as well. It is an irrevocable contract between New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries and the property owner. The owner pays a lump sum and that is placed within a trust. Interest earned is used to provide regular care and maintenance to the tomb or memorial in perpetuity. It is an extremely affordable option, especially when you consider the age of some of the tombs found within our cemeteries. Please contact us if you are interested in obtaining a perpetual care quote for your tomb. Prices differ based on the size and condition of the tomb. I'm now gonna discuss one of our major restoration programs, namely our abandoned tomb initiative. We began the program in 2017, and since that time, we have fully restored 13 tombs within three of our historic cemeteries. Funding for this program comes to us in the form of private and corporate donations, as well as some of our tourism revenue. In New Orleans, it, in New Orleans, it is the responsibility of a tomb owner to care for their individual tomb. Much like houses within a city, the cemetery itself being the city in that analogy. However, with cemeteries dating to the 19th and even 18th centuries, there are instances where the family of the original owner has died out or moved away and the abandoned tomb initiative addresses the type, these types of tombs. To qualify for the program, the tomb must have at least 50 years with no interments, no known owner on file, and must be in a poor condition or generally unstable. Qualifying tombs are fully restored according to standards published by the National Park Service. We use natural line-based mortar and plaster that is not only historically accurate, but also compatible with the historic materials used to initially construct the tomb. This is a very important project for us and one that we take great pride in. The overall cultural landscape of our historic cemeteries are a great treasure to our city and its inhabitants. We hope to continue to grow this program. If you're interested in helping to sponsor the restoration of a tomb through a direct donation or through a fundraiser, please reach out to us. By going into the preservation and restoration section on our website, you can learn more about our abandoned tomb initiative and also learn about ways to care for your own historic tomb. Last year around this time, we held a hands-on tomb cleaning workshop, something that we hope to do again in the future. This year, we weren't able to do it because of COVID, um, but we do hope to do it next year. As part of the preparation for that event, we created a cleaning stone, gravestone and tomb guide, which is now available for download on our website. It walks you through the cleaning process and offers suggestions on cleaning multiple stone types. In addition, this, within the same section we, of our website, we offer links to gravestone cleaning videos and resources produced by the National Park Service. If your, if your tomb needs more than just a slight cleaning, such as restoration work, or if you are unable to clean the tomb yourself, we offer a free, no obligation restoration quote to all property owners. And I really suggest people take advantage of that. Um, because it's a wonderful thing to be able to get a quote. We do not push you to do the work just so you have a better understanding about how much it costs. And if you do decide to do it, you can work towards um, contracting us to do that work for you. But it's our great wish to continue to improve the physical landscape of our cemeteries so that we may continue in our ministry of providing people of all faiths a, great, a graceful and dignified burial. Thank you all for joining us today. It has been a pleasure presenting this information to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Heather. That was super yeah. informative. And I personally learned a lot because I don't have direct experience with a lot of cemetery work is that's not necessarily our purview at the city archives. But um, that all being said, we are getting ready for question time. Give me a second to open up the chat. I will leave all of our contact information up here. And of course, there is the notification about our final session next week. We really hope that you guys join us for the last one. Of course, just to reiterate, the recording and the slides for this session will be up this Tuesday. So let me open up the chat just one moment. Okay. Chat is now open. Let me get the screen up for myself. And we will start asking questions. So welcome back, everybody. Let's begin. And, and again, everybody, the chat is now open for you all to type in questions. Okay, first question. 
Does perpetual care include restoration in the future? With perpetual care, you, you might not ever need a restoration in the future because it's ongoing maintenance. But if um, restoration issues do come up, then yes, it is covered under your perpetual care contract. We only take tombs that are in good condition into perpetual care program. So if your tomb is in poor condition right now, you would have to get it restored prior to entering the program. But yes, it's kind of, it's forever. As long as New Orleans Cemetery, Catholic cemeteries exist, um, your perpetual care contract is valid and your tomb will be taken care of. Excellent. Next question. What happens to abandoned plots? So that's what I talked about with our abandoned tomb program. Um, unfortunately, so if you think about how I mentioned before, tombs kind of being like houses um, within a city. So we are, New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries is kind of the city, and then we have all these houses um, or tombs that might be abandoned. We do not repossess abandoned tombs. Louisiana law allows cemetery operators to do so, but that's not a step that we take. So with abandoned property, we just um, maintain it as best as we can through donations in our abandoned tomb program. Um, we do not think it is the correct thing to repossess and resell the tombs. So that's why a lot of, because the, the tomb maintenance and restoration is, um, it's supposed to fall under the tomb owner. A lot of times that's why so many tombs in our cemeteries are in poor condition because the families have died off or moved away and there, no, there is no known owner. So right now the abandoned plots just exist within our cemeteries and as money becomes available, we work to restore them. But it's a difficult situation, I think, for everybody involved. Right. Um, next question. Will the material from the series remain on your website or should we download? Um, I always recommend downloading just for your records, just to have it handy. But no, uh, our session website for this program will remain up as long as the archives website remains up. We want to make sure that people in, pos you know, in posterity are able to access the information from this session. How often do you inspect tombs with perpetual care? Um, I think there is an inspection schedule, but I'm not completely sure. But I also know that our guys, if they notice anything when they're working out in the cemeteries, just in general, they'll address it. I've noticed a few things with perpetual care tombs just from walking around and I call or email our field staff and they address it right away. Um, I'm not sure what the inspection schedule is. I know that it's probably at least once a year, but it might be even more than once a year. I think um, that kind of plays into our next question, which is what does perpetual care actually mean at the cemeteries? And I think it's, it's kind of what you just described. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, so under the perpetual care contract, we take care of any wear and tear of natural stone. Um, we can patch natural stone. We don't replace the natural stone, but um, with all other things, we do full restorations. It's kind of keeping it in as good of condition as the materials allow. Um, so we work off the, the interest in the trust. So, but really it keeps it in fairly good condition. Any major cracks in natural stone, we're not gonna go and take that piece of natural stone out. We'll just um, repair the crack, but we'll make it as close to being perfect as possible. So really large structural things to, to um, natural materials we won't deal with except for patching. Any man-made materials, it's fully covered. So um, anything like tablets or things where it was a man-made object, we will fully um, restore under the program. Great, great. Next question. What would have happened to people that died from yellow fever if there was no one left to bury them? Oh, like a like the family members, I would assume. Um, yes, yeah. If they did not have a plan in place prior to falling ill, then it would have went through the city and the city would have um, buried the body within a city, city cemetery. Mm -hmm. Much so like today, like we have unclaimed or unidentified remains and those are handled by the city. It would have been the same historically. 
So, so it generally was um, large graves in Potter's Field or Holt Cemetery. Um, depending on the size of the outbreak, there could be mass burials. Gerard Street Cemetery, which I mentioned earlier, they had a yellow fever plot, which was for mass burials. It's really unfortunate, but if you're thinking about, it's hard for us because we, we think about our ancestors being buried in these mass graves, but then you also have to take a step back and think about the people that were doing the burials and their health, how that was affected. So trying to get as many bodies in the ground and away from the living as possible as quickly and efficiently as they could is really their primary concern at the time. It's really sad thinking about how many people have unmarked graves now, but when you're dealing with public health crisis, like really time is of the essence. So right, it's difficult. Right. Um, let's see here. I noticed an entry on a slide for St. Patrick's number one. The entry said Camp Gerard. Where was Camp Gerard? Is that Camp and Gerard maybe what it was? No, that would have been a military camp if it's 1841, but I'm not sure exactly. That would be a good Google question or a question for a military historian, I think. Which slide was that? Do you all remember? That was the 1841 um, burial book. This so one? 17. Mm -hmm. This one right here. So the top one where they died. Did you see that? Camp Trump? Oh, hmm. actually, it could be at the intersection now that's if the right. woman. So mm -hmm. yes, sorry. <laughs> that's an address I've seen many times. Is is the intersection of camp? Yeah, that's an intersection. I'm sorry. Sometimes I have to write re-reference image. <laughs> Let me uh, go back over to our contact slide, and we will continue. So next question. Are there any All Saints Day activities scheduled this year given COVID guidelines? I'm not sure if anybody's able to answer that. Yeah, we are still having the blessings of the tombs um, within our cemeteries. The archbishop and various priests and deacons are still doing that. We ask that all attendees wear masks and socially distance. We're also still having mass um, for St. Louis Cemetery number three. We are trying to have that live broadcasted on our Facebook page, so be on the lookout for that because there are a limited number of occupants allowed within the church. I think only 250 given the guidelines right now by the city. So there might be space for everyone. We're hoping that there's space for everyone, but there, if there's not, you are able to watch it broadcasts um, mm -hmm. through our Facebook page. But for blessings of the graves, like we are still doing that. Excellent. Uh, next question. Was the decision to reenter remains from Gerard Cemetery to Providence Memorial based on race alone? And uh, yes, yes, it was. Yeah, 1957 is where. Solidly in the... segregation. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I am concerned about the safety of visiting some of these older cemeteries. Are there guards at the cemeteries? We do not currently have guards. If you feel as though um, you would like an escort, you can call our main office and we can work with having a member of our staff out there or we can get somebody else to go out there while you're visiting. Um, we do provide that service. So just get in touch with us at, this, at the phone number on this screen and we're happy to um, work with you because we want to make sure that everyone's able to, to feel comfortable visiting their family tombs. Um, could you please elaborate on the 1980s cemetery survey housed at the historic New Orleans collection? Yes. Do you want to pull that up on the screen, Amanda, if sure you can? Thing. I don't remember the exact uh, If you do, pathway. you might even just Google um, and they can. Oh, okay. Should I do HNOC cemetery survey? Yeah, it should pop up then. Excuse my... Um, no. no. Oh, you have to do the H and O C because it's Oops. all fragmented. It confuses. Yeah, it sure did. So as she's pulling it up in the 1980s, um, no. Save Our Cemeteries and the Historic New Orleans Collection. Is this it? Yep, the, that one's it. This. Yep. Um, they got together and they started this project and they 
um, decided also the University of New Orleans. They knew that our cemeteries were a fantastic cultural resource. So they decided to do a survey of eight historic cemeteries. So those are listed at the top. They're St. Louis one, St. Louis two, Lafayette one and two, St. Joseph one and two, Cypress Grove, Oddfellows Rest and Greenwood. So they had volunteers and staff of the institutions go out every single tomb within those cemeteries. They wrote up a conditions card, which has everyone listed on the tablet. It also tells the condition of the tomb. So it says like whether it has major cracks or structural issues. And they took at least one photograph of every single tomb within those eight cemeteries. So it's a great just like portrait of a, a time and place for each cemetery. After the field work was done, all of the field notes were typed up onto index cards and they, were housed, they are housed at the Historic New Orleans collection. They were then transferred to microfilm. So now if you go to the Williams Research Center on Charter Street, you can go in and make an appointment right now because of COVID, you have to make an appointment and you can view the microfilmed index cards and you can also view the photographs, which are also on microfilm. The New Orleans Cemetery database, which I talked about last session, I don't remember what session it is now, that has all of the information for cemetery for St. Louis Cemetery 1 and 2 that's on the microfilm and index cards digitized. And eventually we hope to digitize the entire survey. But it's a really great resource because it has, I mostly use it for the photographs because you're able to see tablets that just don't exist anymore. So by pulling up um, the condition report and also if the photograph's a little bit grainy, especially with microfilm, sometimes you can't see it that well because they have also transcribed everyone's name that's on a tablet. It's a really fantastic resource to um, locating the names of individuals interred within tombs that no longer have tablets. Got it. And also some tombs that have fallen apart since then and no longer exist, exist within the survey, which is great. Yeah, yeah. we have to remember that uh, 1980 was 40 years ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, Next question, what year was cremation opened? What's the price or price range? Uh, is that something the... So cremation, like I said in the, um, on the slide for, the, for Catholicism, the, the ban was lifted in 1963. And since that time, the Catholic church has allowed cremation. Um, in the beginning, they were kind of like, we're lifting the ban, but we don't actually like support it, but now more and more the church is supporting cremation. So the prices vary depending on the location, um, the size. Right now we're having a 15% off sale, which is amazing for the Queen of All Saints garden, just as a response, because we know that a lot of people, especially during COVID, have chosen cremation and are waiting to do um, interments until they could have a larger funeral but if we have that um, offer going on until January 1st I think um, the prices range though I, I don't really know for sure because that's not something that I focus on but if you call our main office they'll be happy to tell you the price range I just don't want to misquote them because I don't I don't um, deal with the sales uh, next question this is a this is an interesting one how can one have a deceased relative's name inscribed on a grave site if the tomb is owned by an unknown distant family member? This is a difficult one. That you would have to call our title clerk, um, Tracy Dillon, and if you, that's our main contact number, and you could work with her to try and sort that out. If the, I'm not sure if you mean a deceased, I guess a deceased relative, I don't know if it's a, person who died a really long time ago that just isn't listed on the tomb or if it's a recent death that was interred. Um, circumstances vary, but she would be the one that you would talk to about that. And that's New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, which I've been circling with the mouse here. How does a descendant of someone buried in St. Louis, number one or two, get access to visit the tomb? I think it, that depends on... That you would have to call our office as well, um, and they would verify your relationship, and then um, give, if, 
if it is verified, they will issue a pass for St. Louis one or two, especially right now, St. Louis two was open to the public, but right now it is also close to the public. So you do need a pass for that one. They're doing run a renovations or construction it was just too hard to control um social distancing because it oh yeah because no one can get in st louis one we had large crowds trying to enter st louis two and it was just an unsafe environment if families wanted to visit the cemetery right, Maria. next question i have a great great grandmother who is buried in a society tomb her son's profession but the closure tablet reads another name would there be a second record for where my ancestor was moved or is there some other possibility here? If she was moved, um, she might just not have her name on the tablet and she might still be in there. If, if it was a transfer, that transfer should be documented within our, within our internment books. And that would be, yeah. New Orleans. It depends on the year. So if you um, yeah. go back through that, the list of like who has what book, um, you could either contact our office if it falls under the years that we have the books for or the Office of Archives and Records if it's within their, their year range for whatever cemetery you're dealing with. That's, that's, this, that's this list right mm -hmm. here. Again, mm -hmm. y'all, this is um, posted as one of the downloadable materials, I believe in session one or two on the, on the main program. Website. It's session two. Session two. Mm -hmm. Let me get, I'm going to transfer back to that, but remember, go to our main program website, archives.nolalibrary.org, identifying your Catholic ancestors fall 2020 genealogy series, and it'll be under session one. Let's go back to having the contact information on screen. What does it mean if there's concrete on top of a coping tomb? So it could mean two things. So night concrete became really, really popular as a solution to a lot of things in the 1950s and 60s. So it might be that the family decided they do not want any further burials within that plot. So they put concrete as a way to seal it off for future burials. It might also be because they did not want to deal with um, plantings on top of it anymore or water intrusion into the plot itself. But concrete, Unfortunately, it's not a really stable material. It will crack and break over time. So it's not a, a good solution to do that. Um, so it really depends on whether the family wanted to like seal it off forever for any other burials. But if that is the case, it will be noted in, the, in our title um, paperwork. If they are accepting burial still, it's probably just the case that they wanna put a barrier between that, the plot and the elements. Uh, this next question, I think, I think what they're trying to ask is, can the cemetery put somebody on the admission list of someone doing research on a family? And I, I don't believe that's the case. Um, you would have to contact our office. I'm not sure about but I'm not I would sure think how to answer given, that. I would think given this the current circumstances, that's unlikely, but again, mm -hmm. contact New Orleans Catholic cemeteries. Uh, this is interesting. Is there not a law regulation that after 25 years of no interments, the cemetery owner can reclaim the tomb as its own and resell it? It's actually long, it's a longer period than that. The law is on the books. Um, as I stated in our, in a few, in, earlier in the presentation, we do not pursue that um, as a cemetery operator, we do not reclaim the tomb and um, resell it. New Orleans, Catholic cemetery. New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries does not do that. We are legally allowed to do that as cemetery operators. That law was put into effect because of the large amount of abandoned tombs, specifically in New Orleans cemeteries. So it is something that cemetery operators can do. Um, we just choose not to because we choose to just honor the remains in place and not disturb them, but it is something that other cemetery operators can legally do. There's a, there's a number of steps that they have to take. They can't just go ahead and do it after 25, however many years. Um, I think it's 50. Um, they have to advertise. There's like a legal process they have to go through, but we, um, New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries does not, does not do that. Okay, this is another question. A tomb in St. Patrick's number one has perpetual care. 
contract, I guess, but she does not see anything happening with the care of it. The top has marble chips and the tablet is very dirty and names worn off. The tomb is very old and purchased years ago. I do not see any care done to the tomb, which is a coping tomb. I, I, I would understand that there's not much that you can do for wearing in dirt. I th I'm not sure what the process is just for cleaning of perpetual care tombs. And I don't know, it's like some tombs have marble, like pieces of, um, some coping tombs are infilled with rocks and white stones, not marble. But if you contact us, um, we could send a member of restoration crew out there to take a look at it and see if there's anything that we can address and whether or not the issues with the tomb do fall under the perpetual care program. But we're happy to go out and take a look at it. Definitely just, just call us or email us and let us know the tomb and we'll definitely take a look at it. New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. How do I find information on a burial in St. Louis Cemetery? There's some information in records from St. Louis Cathedral. How, how do I find, the, the question is generally without getting into specifics because we can't cover specifics in a, in a question and answer session, but how do I find information on burial in St. Louis Cemetery? Uh, it looks like she thinks number one. You guys wanna take that? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, so we don't have any St. Louis Cemetery books that go back to that far, they don't start until 1833 for St. Louis Cemetery number one. Um, so besides the funeral entry, possibly in St. Louis Cathedral, that would be our next bet where we could help you. And then do you have the Archdiocese Office of New Orleans Office of Archives and Records? Yeah, and then um, they might have a, a tablet, in which case, like the cemetery database, once it gets published um, this year, later this year, will be a, a good resource to start with. Um, and some of just the other resources that we've listed throughout the other sessions as well. There are ways, like even without the interment or burial books, there sometimes you get lucky with other resources and you are mm -hmm. able to locate to locate the location location of the tomb or grave. Um, I, I see that she says years ago she saw a reference. It would it would depend on where you saw the reference and if it was from the records of St. Louis Cathedral, in which case that would have been the necessary and or that would have been the extent of the information. And at this juncture, she would probably uh, need to get a pass to look at the cemetery directly. Does that sound right? Uh, no. So she unless she had like exact proof that she was a family member she couldn't uh, get a pass to see um kimberly did you have any other i have it would really depend on the the cemetery uh the office i'm sorry the new orleans catholic cemeteries but because we're not going to have any records that we can prove that they're in number one um we can't say if that's a pass that would be able to be given because we won't have any records for number one at that time period So again, contact the Archdiocese in New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. If an owner replaces an old headstone, are there any approvals or guidelines that need to be followed? Yes, um, that would be, uh, you would need to get a permit and you would work with our, rest, uh, with our um, field office staff um, to help you through that process. But definitely just reach out to us and we're happy to work with you to do that. When requesting information from Sacramental Records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans Office of Archives and Records, if you request two sacraments, such as funeral and burial, are there two charges, 12 and 12? And, and the answer is yes, correct? Correct. It's per sacrament. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and I believe it states that in the form. Yeah, it does. What type of stone do you all recommend that will hold up in our climate? I, I think granite is a really good choice. Um, we use granite a lot now with our newer tombs. Um, it's a really hard stone and it takes a lot of um, wear and tear very easily and it's easy to clean. It's, it holds up really well. Um, 
So I would go with granite if you're looking to, um, to use one for the future. What happens to headstones removed that were damaged? Is the family contacted? So we don't remove them. Um, if they fall or um, they're if we notice that they're broken, they will be placed against the tomb. Um, I think we do contact whoever um, we have on file, but it's really hard for us to know whether or not that um, tablet or headstone had fallen 80 years ago or if it had fallen last week. So it's not something that we generally contact families about because it would just be really hard to keep track. We have literally thousands and thousands of individual tombs and monuments. So we do not um, remove headstones from the cemetery. So it's generally, we put the, we put the headstone or tablet um, up against the tomb to which we believe it belongs. It's, it's much like the analogy you used where it's a city and these are individually owned houses. Uh, the mm -hmm. owners would be responsible for the damage mm -hmm. um, of the to, to the tomb. So it would require you to maintain a watch on the tomb, but you guys are not going to remove any, any damaged materials. No. Got it. Um, let's see here. If the tomb is transferred to another unrelated family years ago, are there records of the first family's deceased buried in tomb? I think it depends on the time period. They, they will have their burial or interment record. So as we've stated before, the burial and interment books are not by tomb, they're by date and name of the interred. So, and sometimes without a location. So we do have transfer records. Um, even if it's a long time ago, they still hold transfer records. And we'll talk, we'll show some examples of that next week, actually. So you'll be able to understand it a bit better after we go through next week's session. Oh, great, great. Um, I have ancestors who are poor Irish immigrants and can find no burial records for them. Where might they have been buried if they died in the 1880s to 1910s? And I'm assuming that's Potter's or, or it's not Holt yet. It depends if they were Catholic or not. Um, it depends on their faith. It also, even if people had very, very little money, especially Catholics, I found that the last little bit of money they have, a lot of them would choose to have a Catholic burial because being interred within sacred ground was so important to them. Um, so I would not rule out them being one of our cemeteries as opposed to a, a city cemetery or a, a, what they call Potter's Field. I think um, it's worth looking at if you have the exact names and date of deaths. And if you look through the ob obituary index um, or other death uh, records and are able to figure out what cemeteries you can put in a request um, to see if they're within one of our cemeteries or not. It's, it's tough um, yeah. without doing those, that first bit of leg work. But, but I think I would work on that first and try to find as much information as you can and then circle back to us if you find that they are interred within a, one of our cemeteries and we're happy to help you try to locate them. Um, we're approaching 1220, so I'm just going to uh, read a couple more questions. Again, if we don't get to your question today, because I do see that there are a lot more listed, please um, email us using the contact information on the screen today. Uh, the next question is, we'll, we'll do a couple more. Um, for tombs that have unreadable stones, is there a plan to add a name tag or provide map that identifies the interred? I... That's up to the families. So if the tomb owner wishes to have a replacement tablet or to have a plaque um, listing those interred, like we fully support that and we'll work with you to get that done. But as a cemetery operator, that's not something that is, um, honestly, it's not something that's within our budget to be able to do. I wish that it was, but um, it's just not something that we would be able to handle because of the magnitude yeah, of that, the amount of tombs that we deal with. Up manpower and hiring that are not available to cultural institutions like us. Mm -hmm. um, is Carrollton Cemetery in any of this information? No, Carrollton is a city cemetery, so you will want to head to archives.nolalibrary.org. 
and you'll want to go down to the genealogy section and go to the guide to genealogical materials. Let me do just a real quick test drive of that. This is us, archives.nolalibrary.org. You want to scroll down, down, down to genealogy, and you want to look at our guide to genealogical materials. You are interested in a cemetery, so you will click on burial records. And this is uh, where what information we have on Carrollton will be. I will do um, a control F, control to find Carrollton. So as you can see, we have um, limited stuff. Uh, you'll want to take a look at it. It just depends on your time frame, etc. But uh, if you have questions, this is us, the uh, city archives right here. And let us take one more. Uh, what are the possible cemeteries of interment of an ancestor who was enslaved, but who had purchased her freedom to be buried in the late 1700s or early 1800s? And where would someone look for those records? That is early. So that would either be the St. Peter Street Cemetery or St. Louis One, probably. I don't know. It depends on how early in the 1800s. Um, if it's past 1822, there are more options, but prior to 1822, it would probably be in St. Louis One or um, the St. Peter Street Cemetery, depending on the year. Mm -hmm. Like we stated before, the records for that period um, are very spotty to non-existent. Uh, funeral records exist for some individuals, but it's, it's a tough one. Do you guys have something to add? I would like to say, because um, our records for St. Louis number one don't begin until 1833, so if they fall after that, we might have an entry possibly for them we've seen in there. Um, if you know like where they were enslaved in the area, maybe like if it's an early St. John the Baptist, but I don't even know if that goes early enough. Um, we might have a funeral or something, but that just depends also on the church and the book. So this sounds like a question to, to ask mm -hmm. of, of the um, Office of Archives and Records. Well, um, we have uh, hit our limit on questions. I know there are a lot more. Again, y'all, please use the information here on the screen. Please visit the program hub page that we've uh, pointed to. And of course, um, I also want to say to everyone, if you do email me, which will be, I try uh, to, if you guys want to describe it, sort of a, a guided tool. You keep coming in and out, Amanda. Heather, what were you going to say? For anybody that emails me, if I don't email you back within a day or two, or I, I misplace your email, please email me again. I try to respond to everyone, but I get a ton of emails. So I really want to make sure that if you do email me, I am able to communicate with you. So just please remind me um, if I don't get to your question in a timely manner. I don't mind being reminded multiple times that I prefer that than to n miss your question altogether. Mm -hmm. And same goes for us. Just email us again if you don't hear back from us. And um, if you have any questions off the Q&A that we didn't answer, please just send us an email um, off of that. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. And then all this information will be posted, the recording will be posted on Tuesday and we'll put a link to it on our Facebook page, um, letting everybody know. But we hope that you enjoyed the session. We'll leave up the, oh, I think Amanda got knocked off, but um, our contact information is available. So please just get in touch. Thank you. Sorry, y'all, I got cut out. Um, again, thank you all for attending. Come visit us again next week. Be sure to send us relevant questions and be sure to check out archives.nolalibrary.org. And again, thank you guys. Thank you guys for returning and we look forward to seeing you for the very last session next weekend. Bye.